Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Thank you so much for being over here on a Monday evening. We hope we make it interesting for you. So, Bob's all the way over here. Just we've interrupted him on his morning coffee run, and he's over here just to be there with us and share his valuable insights. So, let's say all hello to Bob. Okay, friends, uh, I would really appreciate if all of us could just say hi to Bob on the chat button. So, he would really love it. Just say hi, Bob, on the chat button. Okay, so friends, I'll start. Welcome to today's webinar, Practitioner's Insight, Investor Risk Profiles and Portfolio Strategy, hosted by the CFA Society. I'd like to take a moment to welcome all the audience from across the world for joining us remotely. I'm sure you're enjoying the new virtual conferences, but we hope it's interesting for you. I am Mohit Beriwala, CFA. I run a private boutique wealth advisory firm, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Well, Today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes, including question and answer. We will be leaving enough time for question and answer after the presentation. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. You can do so by clicking the Q&A box on the bottom of your viewer. That's right. Q&A box at the bottom of your viewer. Type a question in the box. This presentation will be available to view after the presentation concludes in the chat box. So after the presentation ends, please do not go out in the beginning or in the middle. At the end of the conference, there will be a link. You can go online, click the link and download the presentation. Also remember, great feedback is super good, right? And honest feedback is even better. So please complete the evaluation survey just before you sign up. It will take hardly a couple of minutes. Now, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Bob Denhauser, CFA, FRM, CIA. So, Bob has a huge, huge, long thing what I can talk about him, but I'm just going to trade in short lines. He's a writer, consultant, researcher, and he's focused on sustainable investing, asset management, and wealth management. He's a senior advisor to the Investment Integration Project and an applied research and consultancy addressing risk management and sustainability investing. From, 27, from 2007 to 2019, almost about 12 years, he served on the staff of CFA Institute. He was the head of global private wealth management. And what I can say, uh, he lives in New Jersey of New York, USA. He holds a master's in public health. Wow, great time. <laughs> of the University of Medicine from the University of Medicine and Dispensary of New Jersey. He has a master's in business, business administration from Cornell University, a bachelor's of arts degree in political science, and he's also based in the New York area. So, over to all. Well, he, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for joining me uh, at the end of your day. It's just getting started here in New Jersey. Let me just launch our screen here. So you should all be able to see uh, the beginning of the presentation now. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to CFA societies, but CFA Society India in particular, and on this particular topic, because it was four or five years ago when I had the pleasure to visit India and go around the country and talk about client risk profiling. And uh, I met with a great reception there. Um, I was very surprised actually. Uh, uh, CFA had scheduled me to speak on weekends and, and many of you came out to, to listen. And I, I, was, I was just so impressed that there was such strong interest in uh, understanding the current issues and state of the art of the practice of wealth management. But a lot of those discussions got me thinking more about um, what more needed to be done to help practitioners do a, an effective job of uh, risk profiling and connecting that to um, the ultimate value that they deliver 
uh, in constructing portfolios and delivering investment results. And so in some respects, this is the culmination of those couple of years of coming back and thinking and talking to other practitioners and academics, um, which has resulted in the publication of a paper uh, by CFA Institute that we'll be talking about and that this, this presentation is, is basically based on. So this is, this is the essence of what we're gonna talk about today. This is a cartoon from the New Yorker from a number of years ago, and it's sort of every advisor's nightmare, certainly every client's nightmare, and something that regulators in particular are focused on. So the idea that uh, clients wake up one day to find unexpected results in their portfolio, and you know the way this goes, if it's unexpectedly good results, um, you're a hero, or perhaps they're the hero for having the foresight to have hired you or, or done something else in the portfolio to, to result in those great results. But more often it's, it's the, the bad results, the downturns in markets that people discover that their portfolios haven't performed as they expected, even though the performance might be very reasonable given the way it's been structured and the underlying portfolio strategy. And so regulators in particular are really interested in preventing these sorts of mishaps where clients feel that they've been missold products that have risk profiles that are not appropriate to their objectives or just um, that they find that they're very uncomfortable with. And again, the, the tension that we constantly work with here is that everybody loves the upside, nobody likes the downside, but in fact, you need to sort of accept the downside um, to have a shot at the upside. So SEBI is unusual. Um, I've looked at um, regulatory requirements around the world and SEBI does a better job than most, I have to say, in giving financial advisors more clues about just what it is that they need to do to be in compliance with their requirements. And so I've, I've got a couple of pages here that, where I reprint um, what SEBI is listed in the investment advisor regulations from 2013, I guess modified um, in 2016. And you sort of see the, the, the expected stuff. Um, advisors are expected to get some basic demographic data, some basic financial data, I've highlighted uh, Roman numeral number five, risk appetite and tolerance. Interesting um, that SEBI requires this, but they don't go out of their way to define just exactly what it is that they're looking for. It's, it's understood that people know that uh, it's important to understand their clients or their prospects, uh, appetite or tolerance for risk, but everyone kind of shies away from talking too specifically about what that might be. And again, I'm, I'm not singling SEBI out here. In fact, they're much more explicit than most other regulators who um, don't even necessarily go into more detail that we see on these following pages here. So here, SEBI talks about the process for assessing uh, client risk. So the client's capacity for absorbing loss, very important. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, the client's willingness to accept the risk of loss of capital um, and appropriately interpreting client responses to questions. So SEBI's anticipating that practitioners will use some sort of questionnaire or other interview format to elicit some of the information that they get here. Uh, number C is, or, or letter C uh, is really interesting. So um, if you're gonna use tools, Sebi is saying, you need to be responsible for assuring that they're fit for purpose and any limitations are identified and mitigated. And one of the things that really came through in my discussions uh, with all of you when I was there in 2016 was that a lot of the risk profiling tools that were available in the commercial market were pretty close to being black boxes. It was really difficult to understand what was going on under the hood. You could certainly walk through the questionnaires that were uh, in them, but it was difficult to understand whether they really were indeed fit for purpose. And we're gonna to try to talk about some of the things that you can look for today um, to assure yourself that they are indeed. And just the last page on, on SEBI requirements, um, Really like number D where they say um, the language has to be straightforward and fair, clear, and not misleading, uh, which turns out to be more challenging than you might expect because often the tools and the questionnaires are written by practitioners with a practitioner mindset. And you know we all talk in a different language with different vocabulary than most of our clients do. And so it's really important to take what we're hoping to get out of the questionnaires and make it um, in a language that's approachable and clear to the folks who are taking it so that we get accurate responses from them. And then the last is, is kind of standard. So making sure that you feed back to the client that uh, what you've learned about the risk profile to test um, your conclusions are based on um, the information that they provided you and get any reactions uh, from them. 
uh, and also to get their assent that, that um, you've explained to them what you think that the risk profile is and how that will guide portfolio strategy. So the regulatory requirements in India are, are um, a little bit more drawn out, a little bit better specified um, than in many, many other uh, jurisdictions, including the US where, where I'm based. Uh, but there's still quite a bit that's left um, to interpretation um, by the practitioner, which can be problematic. There's, there's really no uniform standard um, or letter of law that's exactly um, I love this, this quote from uh, Meyer Statman. You may have um, heard Meyer before. I think he's been through India to talk to the CFA Society. He's a professor here in, in the States in California in behavioral finance. And this, this really gets to the heart of the issue, that people are rational in standard finance, but they're normal in their behavioral uh, expectations. Rational people care about utilitarian ca characteristics, but not value expression ones. They're never confused by cognitive errors. They have perfect self-control uh, and so on whereas normal people don't feel obligated to follow that pattern. And indeed, all of our clients are normal people. And interestingly, perhaps a little bit less often uh, considered is that we all as practitioners are normal people. We have our own biases and cognitive and behavioral quirks um, that we need to account for and be sure to um, overcome in the, in the course of rendering advice. So what do advisors actually do? Um, they have this requirement that they need to assess their client's risk tolerance, uh, but there are no, uh, it's not math. You know, it's not an objective equation that they can solve. There's, there's quite a bit of subjective analysis that goes into the problem. And so what they do is they apply their professional judgment. And that's certainly not a bad thing. Um, it's, it's uh, in fact, why we're here in the business, right? If, if we weren't applying our own professional judgment, it's very likely that our clients could be equally satisfied um, with an algorithm, uh, with a robo-advisor, with, with some sort of technological solution that didn't have the benefit of what we've learned, what we've experienced, and how we apply that knowledge to our clients' um, unique circumstances. The trouble, however, is that advisors are not uniform in applying that professional judgment because professional judgment itself is not well-defined or, or specified. Um, advisors may think that they're doing a better job of things than they actually are. And so one example is that in the old days, and let's call the old days maybe 10 years ago, it was very common, perhaps most common, for financial advisors to explore risk assessment and risk profiling with their clients by sitting down across the table with them and having a chat and talking about it. And based on that conversation, forming an opinion about what their client's risk assessment does. Well, there was a study done uh, a number of years ago that looked at uh, a comparison of what uh, advisors who had those kinds of conversations and arrived at a judgment about their clients' um, risk tolerance uh, compared to a psychometrically uh, valid um, questionnaire format. So something that had some scientific heft behind it in terms of its ability to actually probe clients and determine their real attitudes towards risk. And the correlation between the two was 0.4. So that would suggest that in fact, um, if a advisor just sort of wings it and goes on, on the basis of what they can pick up in a conversation, um, they are gonna do something rather different than if they applied a more robust empirical approach using a, um, as I say, a psychometrically validated uh, questionnaire. And again, we're gonna talk more about questionnaires in just a couple of minutes. And so that's a little problematic. Um, advisors are, are compensated and are valued because of their professional judgment, but in fact, professional judgment may not be sufficient or sufficiently applied in this case to do a good job. And not to harp on the negative, but um, just one more example of that, uh, a study of 200 uh, financial advisors across the globe, although just over half of them were based in Canada. So uh, make of that what you will, there might be some regional biases. Um, they were given um, identical, identical risk profile information uh, for five different clients and um, asked to um, construct portfolios based on that. And they were given some you know, fixed expected returns for equities, fixed income, and cash. Um, what they didn't know was that each of those five hypothetical clients had exactly the same risk profile. So all of the information regarding their risk tolerance was exactly the same but it was camouflaged in different narratives around those, those uh, clients. So 
Um, you know, some were a little bit older, some were a little bit younger, some were um, uh, single, some of them were married. Um, things that were interesting from a financial planning perspective, but didn't necessarily uh, impact you know, individual uh, risk profiles. And what the study found was that um, the portfolio recommendations that advisors actually ended up with didn't statistically uh, significantly stray from a very simple heuristic, which was take 100, subtract uh, the client's age, and that's their risk asset exposure, in this case, their, their equity exposure, which is sort of the shorthand that a lot of retail investors use when they approach um, planning. That's what, um, in the early days, what a lot of target date funds did to, to arrive at their uh, risk posture uh, in those portfolios. But again, a little bit disappointing that uh, 200 professional advisors couldn't make more of data that was presented to them uh, and end up with something a little bit more um, customized. This study was done or written about by um, Amy Hubble and John Grable. John Grable is a professor at the University of Georgia. Uh, Amy was one of his PhD students and is now a practicing financial advisor, uh, also a CFA charter holder. And it's uh, Amy and John that I reached out to and had some conversations with and ended up co-authoring the paper that um, uh, we're talking about today. So you'll see their name uh, coming up uh, in, in uh, future slides. They wrote this other paper called The Efficient Front Tuzzle, What Investment Risk uh, Profiling Still Fails to Solve, which I think is quite good. You see the site for it here and towards the end, I'll also uh, give you the link where you can go and have a look at that paper. If you have the time, I certainly do recommend it. So what Amy and John and I set out to do was to establish um, best practices for advisors uh, when they confront the client risk profiling challenge. And uh, what we ended up with is surprisingly straightforward, I think. Um, it's probably things that many advisors already do, but in our conversations with advisors, um, we find that many tend to emphasize one dimension over another or don't particularly account for uh, uh, one dimension when they're thinking about risk profiling specifically. It, it may come up in other parts of financial planning, but it's, it's not necessarily something that they're applying to this particular uh, puzzle. And so the paper that we wrote, um, which is available on the CFA Institute website, uh, recommended that people measure and reconcile, and that reconcile uh, piece is especially important because these three dimensions that we talk about of an investment risk profile can often be in conflict with each other. And the three dimensions very simply are risk need, risk taking ability, and behavioral loss tolerance. And I'm actually gonna go in reverse order. I wanna start with um, behavioral loss tolerance because I think that's where the commercial world is focused and where a lot of practitioners come up perhaps a little bit short in thinking about how they're going to um, work with their clients. So behavioral loss tolerance, um, you get into some vocabulary problems. Um, people talk about risk tolerance, risk preferences, risk ability. Um, all kind of sort of mean the same sorts of things. We strove to uh, define things a little bit more carefully. And we think that behavioral loss tolerance is composed of six elements that you see listed here. And they're all closely related. In fact, um, as, as we've talked to practitioners who have sort of implemented this framework, um, one of the pieces of feedback we got was, well, um, there aren't very many surprises. Once you start um, understanding where your clients are on one or two or three of these, it's, it's really surprising if you learn something startlingly new when you get to the fourth, fifth, or sixth uh, dimension of loss tolerance. But that said, we think it's a real mistake to take shortcuts here because they're all um, addressing slightly different aspects of a client's makeup and a client's uh, willingness and ability to, to uh, weather losses in their portfolio. It's kind of like saying, well, you know, I expect that high salary people will also have high net worth. And, and in many cases, that's certainly true, but you certainly wouldn't want to construct a financial plan making the assumption that because of one, uh, the other was also true. You'd want to go and verify, in fact, that both, both those instances were true. So let's just talk a little bit about what I mean by each of these elements. So risk tolerance is, um, perhaps the hardest to get your arms around because it addresses the client's willingness to take on uncertainty um, for an for a incremental uh, bit of return. And uh, this is where questionnaires often are focused. It's really on uh, identifying clients' uh, ability to tolerate, to, to live with 
um, the fact of additional risk um, in achievement of additional reward. And we'll talk a little bit more in just a sec about how um, some of those uh, questionnaires might most effectively get at that. Risk preference is related. It's, it's um, addressing everything else being equal, what a client would prefer. And most clients tend to be risk averse. Um, the, the difference between the first and the second here is that while a client might prefer lower risk investments, they would be willing to take on more risk um, to achieve a particular return that in, in, uh, uh, might allow them to uh, uh, realize a financial goal of theirs. And so understanding a client's preference for risk is certainly important, but you really need to marry that with risk tolerance to understand whether uh, a riskier portfolio is indeed um, appropriate for a client. Financial knowledge is um, something that's um, You've got to be teased out by an advisor. Um, most um, questionnaires will not address this particular facet. There are separate questionnaires that can help you get at this. So in the States, uh, FINRA has a investor questionnaire that can help you um, in a fairly painless way for both you and the, and the client understand their basic knowledge of financial instruments and how markets work and how investing works. And the basic idea here is that the more financial knowledge uh, a client has, the more prepared they are to assume risk. So somebody who has no knowledge of how markets work is not going to be especially well prepared um, to take on risk. A very similar dimension, investing experience. Uh, we have a, uh, I hate to say it because it's such a horrible thing going on right now, but it's a, it's a wonderful natural experiment in, in some respects in that markets took a real shock in March. And so it's really interesting to go back and take a look and see what investors actually did in the face of that, that sharp downturn in global markets, because it speaks to um, uh, their ability to stay the course or hold the course during difficult times or not, um, you know, to, to reach for the panic button and do things that history would suggest would tend to crystallize losses rather, rather than uh, something more productive. Risk perception is also cognitive. So it's something that, that um, is difficult to tease out with an objective questionnaire, but um, a careful discussion with an advisor, I think can inform um, the client's perception of risk in markets. And this can be influenced by what the client wakes up and listens to on the radio or what they see on the morning news show or, or the kinds of things that they're reading um, in terms of coloring their perception of just how risky markets are right now and how closely that uh, relates to the actual risk uh, in markets now. And finally, risk composure. So uh, what clients actually do in the face of um, a market um, shock or a, or a bear market. So are they able to stay with what they say they will? If they say they're willing to endure risks, if they say that they're willing to tolerate uh, a degree of risk and downside in their portfolio, did they actually stay the course uh, when something bad happens. And again, um, what we've seen through the pandemic and, and uh, in March in particular is a, is a great near-term example of that. Uh, before this, people were reaching back to 2007, 2008 to see how folks uh, reacted during the financial crisis. So these six dimensions, we think are key to understanding that third dimension of behavioral loss tolerance. And I mentioned that in particular, risk tolerance uh, is one where you really need to think about using a tool um, to help you identify uh, where your clients are thinking and what their attitudes and preferences are. To do that um, is tough, frankly, because there's a whole science that goes uh, into psychometrics, uh, into designing uh, effective survey instruments that will get at um, what you're hoping to discern from, from your clients. And the two dimensions that we tend to worry about uh, from a psychometric standpoint are validity and reliability. Validity is how accurate the tool is actually in, in describing um, or in fact predicting attitudes and behavior and reliability, which is how good is that instrument at generating the same results in different circumstances. So if you gave somebody a questionnaire on a day when the market was up 3% and then you gave the same instrument to somebody a week later when the market was down 3%, uh, would, it, would it end up with the same results? 
So um, for financial advisors, we don't expect um, that people will become psychometricians. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a nasty little practice uh, or field that I've discovered. There's a, there's, it, it seems most akin to um, actuaries in terms of, of relating a lot of math to um, the kinds of issues that we typically worry about. But um, I think it's useful to have at least a foundation of knowledge um, about what you should be looking for to engage some of the commercial providers in a discussion for how they've addressed some of these issues. And you can use your judgment as to whether um, their approaches are sound, whether they have sort of anticipated the questions that you're asking, or whether what you're asking seems either completely new to them or not something that they really want to discuss, which I think would be um, red flags. So the two dimensions of, of validity that we worry about are content validity. Um, just does the content that's covered in the questionnaire uh, seem appropriate to a practitioner? And financial advisors are extremely well prepared to render a judgment on this. So if you go through a questionnaire, you can um, see whether it's in fact dealing with the kinds of issues that you will deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, or whether it seems to sort of um, go off in kind of strange directions for, for whatever reason. Uh, so content validity and then criterion validity. Um, uh, understanding whether um, the uh, questions in the questionnaire actually provide evidence that they're related to uh, current behavior. So uh, an example would be if you're, if you're doing a risk questionnaire, you'd like to know that a higher score actually has been related to um, the respondents having higher equity holdings. So they have a greater tolerance for risk and that's reflected in their current um, um, risk posture. Um, as well as predictive uh, validity. So taking that same concept and looking out to the future. If um, people are, are um, thinking about uh, having a, a higher score on this based on the questions that are asked in the, in the questionnaire, um, are they going to uh, stay the course and be more willing to bear the risk even in difficult times um, uh, in the future? I mentioned reliability, so we want to make sure that um, if you use a questionnaire that it's going to be uh, useful in all weather. It's not just uh, uh, reliant on the current context or circumstances. Um, getting way down into the weeds here, and I'm not going to spend any time on it really, but just to say that the most common metric that's associated with reliability is something called Cronbach's alpha, and 0 0.7 seems to be the magic uh, cutoff. You want a score of greater than 0 0.7 to indicate uh, a statistical reliability of the questions that are asked. And the statistics have to do with um, variance and covariance and correlations between the, between the questions. Um, you can game that a little bit. Um, so one common way to boost uh, Cronbach's alpha is just to ask more questions. Uh, just the fact of a greater number of questions will tend mathematically to increase the score of Cronbach's alpha. And so there's, there's some criticism in test taking circles right now about whether this is the right measure. Um, it's something to keep an eye on, I think, but for the time being, it's a, it's a useful place to start in your discussions with vendors. So things that, as you, as you look at some of these commercial risk assessment tools, things that perhaps should worry you a little bit. Um, the first is questions outside the context of investment risk taking. So the classic is uh, people will say, well, do you, do you like to engage in risky hobbies? Do you ride a motorcycle? Do you um, go, go parachuting for fun? The idea being that if you like to take risks in your personal life, that will extend to your investing life as well. And the research would indicate that the two are not good predictors of each other. And so there's no reason to believe that if I engage in dangerous hobbies that um, that should have any particular bearing on my attitudes or preference for risk taking. Uh, questions that make investors anticipate their future behavior are also problematic and something that you ought to be concerned about on a questionnaire. So we know that investors tend to discount what happens in the future inappropriately. Um, the behavioral finance people call it hyperbolic discounting. Uh, they're just very bad at anticipating, in fact, what their future behavior is beyond a fairly short time frame. And so asking them about it is kind of pointless because they're just bad predictors of their own potential behavior. Um, it, it really doesn't lend any useful insight. Questions that pose 50-50 um, chances. So it'll, it'll sort of read, you know, there's a 50% chance that uh, X will happen and a 50% chance that Y will happen. Which do you prefer? 
And in the real world, of course, um, very, very rarely are there exact 50-50 odds for any particular outcome. So the, the feeling is that this doesn't really shine any great light on an investor's risk tolerance. Questions that are leading. So um, uh, a question that says something about, well, experts often um, uh, recommend that you withstand downturns in the market. Uh, if the market were go to go down 6%, what would you do? Well, you've, you've kind of led the witness there by saying, well, experts are telling us it really should should hang in there and withstand the market. Um, so you're biasing the potential results there. People will tend to give you the answer that they think that you're looking for. Uh, questions that use complex language. We talked about this a little bit in the context of SEBI's requirements. Um, uh, CFA charter holders are amongst the worst offenders here, myself included. Um, we, we've learned all this really cool stuff and it all comes with a really interesting vocabulary that's useful for us. It's very specific, it's very technical, um, but uh, the real world, people that are our clients and prospects have no idea what we're talking about. And so to toss in or sprinkle in uh, even things that we think may not be so problematic, so words like conservative or capital appreciation um, or return on investment, um, without being absolutely sure that clients understand those terms, it's kind of pointless to include them uh, in questions uh, designed to elicit risk preferences. And again, in those six dimensions, if you've learned a little bit about your client's financial knowledge and investment experience, you'll have a better sense for how lost they will be with um, even some of the simpler terms of, of our industry. Um, this next one is, is especially interesting because um, almost without exception, every advisor I've talked to, even ones who are really interested in this topic and wanna to do an exceptionally good job of it, are also really worried about presenting their client with something that's too long, something that takes too long or that just um, drags out a little bit. Uh, they'd really like to get this over with in five or six questions. And indeed there are commercial systems out there that say you can do a good job of this in five or six questions. We would argue with that. We think it takes uh, probably between 10 and 25 questions to get a statistic, statistically valid response and give you enough information to form a judgment about your client's um, risk profile. And the way that people try to cheat and get around this is they say, well, okay, I really don't wanna give my client 20 questions because um, that's just way too much time to ask of them and, and um, it's, it's just not productive to give them that long of an assignment. So I'm gonna give them 10 questions, but I'm gonna make some of them double headers. I'm gonna ask essentially two questions in the same question. So uh, maybe I'll ask about market downturns, but I'll also ask about um, uh, variability of returns over time. Uh, and that's a problem. You, you really don't want to be too ambitious with your questions in a questionnaire. Um, just ask the question that you're seeking the insight for and move on to the next insight and don't try to combine them. And again, closely related that last one, too few questions. Um, again, I understand the, the impulse and the motivation, but in fact, we think that this is uh, an area where it makes sense to spend time with clients and talk with them thoroughly and have them provide as thorough a response. And that generally means more questions than not. And again, um, you could easily imagine two dozen questions um, to get a, a, a good job done of this. So that's a, that's a believe it or not, a fairly quick look at the, um, the third dimension of the investment risk profile, the behavioral loss tolerance. And again, in the paper, um, there's a bit more information for you to help you um, discern how to evaluate some of the commercial systems that are out there, including some references to some other uh, academic work that's been published that you might find interesting. Let's move on though and talk about um, risk-taking ability. So the second of those dimensions, which I think is the most commonly ignored dimension in forming a uh, judgment of client's risk assessment or risk pro um, profile. Risk-taking ability refers to um, the ability to withstand a um, uh, downturn in markets or, or negative returns without sacrificing uh, something that's essential to the client. So standard of living or other uh, essential financial goals. And the three dimensions that we think are relevant to that are time horizons. So um, closely related to age, but not necessarily exactly the client's age because there are some goals that a client might have that extend beyond their expected lifespan. So philanthropic goals or, or legacy goals to uh, succeeding generations. 
a need for liquidity, uh, probably the most important of these, frankly. Um, so near-term needs for liquidity will have a very, very definite impact on the ability to take risk um, over the short term. So uh, if I know that I need to make a capital contribution for a business that I'm involved in in the next three years, that represents a significant part of my net worth, that's going to have a very, very definite uh, impact on how much risk I can take in these coming three years. And risk capacity. Um, so how much of my financial future is dependent on the investment portfolio? If I'm fortunate enough to have um, pension income coming in or annuity income that's already been set up or a very, very high likelihood of receiving um, uh, payments from um, estates of other people, that may make my capacity to assume risk in the investment portfolio a bit greater than it would otherwise. So how much, how much do I need the investment portfolio, frankly, um, to take my uh, investment goals further? And again, I think um, we'll talk about how important this, this uh, risk-taking ability is in considering the overall investment risk profile. This is the one where I think uh, advisors don't often enough explicitly account for their client situations. And then finally, the, the last of the three dimensions, which is risk need. And this is, this is really uh, part and parcel of every financial plan that's ever been written. It's figuring out what your client's goals are and then thinking about what the required rate of return is for achievement of those goals um, through making some sort of present value um, comparison between current assets, present value of the future cash flows, both in and out, so savings and spending. Um, and then the present value of liabilities, which are the, the expected outflows to fund whatever the goals might be for your, for your client. And then thinking about that required rate of return given the current market uh, environment and trying to decide whether it's realistic or not. Uh, interesting that we talk about risk need here in the context of required rate of return. Um, it is what it is. This is again where, where uh, advisors will be applying some of their professional judgment to consider whether the rate of return that comes out from this very objective, you know, easy to do in Excel calculation and thinking about whether that um, reflects a unrealistic or a high or a moderate or a low uh, need for risk. Uh, the other dimension to, to factor in here is a consequence of failure. So for essential goals, um, something that the client feels is just absolutely 100% essential um, you, you would like to have more assuredness of achieving that goal. And so that may cause you to think about um, either taking on more risk to achieve it and economizing elsewhere or adjusting spending and saving habits uh, to make sure that those goals are, are achieved. So the fun stuff, which is reconciling those three dimensions, uh, risk need, the ability to take risk and the behavioral loss tolerance uh, reconciling all three of those dimensions to create portfolio strategy. And one of the errors that we've seen financial advisors do is to try to create questionnaires or other measurement tools that combine all of those dimensions and then take an average of the responses to each of them to get a sense for overall risk assessment. And it really doesn't work that way. There's a few that should dominate others um, that we talk about here. So the first, perhaps most important, risk need can't exceed risk taking ability for the goal. So if risk-taking ability is constrained for any of the reasons that we talked about, there's a need for liquidity or a short time horizon or anything like that, just because the need is great doesn't mean that it should exceed that risk-taking ability. And in fact, it would be problematic if uh, an advisor decided that risk-taking ability uh, wasn't, wasn't worthy of being weighted in excess of the need for risk. So, you know, the classic, um, solution to this problem where the risk need is higher than risk taking ability is to think about adjusting spending and savings um, so that you can whittle down the work that the investment portfolio needs to do to achieve goals. Uh, the second one, lower risk need can be discounted when ability and tolerance are higher. So if the, my risk taking ability is high and my client's tolerance for risk is high, um, I can actually structure a portfolio that may have higher risk than uh, what's actually needed to achieve the goals. And the reasons that you might want to do this would be to um, achieve some of the stretch goals that a client may have. So they've taken care of their essential needs with their financial planning and your investment portfolio strategy. Uh, maybe you want to take some more risks uh, in the hopes of enhancing their legacy uh, provisions uh, to succeeding generations. You're not sacrificing 
their current objectives to do so, and they've got the ability and tolerance to, to go ahead and do that. High tolerance can be discounted when need and ability are low. So your client is a risk taker, likes to take risk perhaps, uh, but their need to take that risk and their ability are in fact are low. And this is one of the most important uh, added values that an advisor can offer, which is to coach their client to tone down that risk tolerance, to be a little bit less um, uh, prone to taking risks because they really don't need to. Um, and in fact, their ability to do that um, is low. This next one about low tolerance is a bit controversial. So uh, we say low tolerance can't be ignored, but it might be coachable um, if the need is high and the ability is high. So this is a client who, uh, by virtue of your discussions with them and whatever uh, survey instruments you may have used, reveals that they have a very, very, very conservative um, posture on risk. And yet they have a high risk need and a high ability to take risk. There are some who would say, um, this is not a client where you move off that low risk posture. They've, they've expressed to you, you've solicited the information, you understand that they don't have tolerance for risk. And so to introduce risk into the portfolio in any meaningful way is um, a mistake. Others would say, um, no, in fact, again, this is one of those points where a financial advisor can add value by helping a client become more comfortable with financial risk and helping them make the connection between taking on that risk and achieving their financial goals over the long, a long time. I don't know enough about, frankly, the compliance environment um, in India to say which side of the fence you ought to come down here, talk to your compliance people and see how comfortable they would be if you, again, were on record as having solicited this information, understanding that your client has low risk tolerance, and then um, you deciding to um, try to reach a middle ground where the portfolio does in fact have more risk. If things go badly, um, it's, it's a difficult situation, I think. On the other hand, um, if you're successful in coaching your client, um, it's possible for them to achieve more with their money than, than they might otherwise have thought. And then the last one, risk-taking ability is an upper bond on, uh, bound on portfolio volatility. So we've talked about how that really needs to be sort of the, the uh, deciding dimension here in terms of an ability to take on risk, but that risk-taking ability changes over time. So by measuring it or assessing it uh, now, you're not done. You really need to come back and look at this. Some would recommend as often as six months. I personally think that's a little bit of an overkill if you've done a thorough financial plan or have access to that plan. If you were to revisit risk-taking ability every year or two, I think that would be that would be adequate. But don't assume that what you've assessed today will in fact be appropriate for guiding strategy um, two or three years from now. One quick note, because um, we're running a little bit short on time, but. Um, the, the ideal way to take what you've learned from doing the risk profile work is to make sure that it's reflected in an investment policy statement um, uh, for your investor. Um, investment policy statements are increasingly used in different jurisdictions for individual investors like high net worth investors. Uh, in 2016, when I visited with you all there, um, the actual practice of including IPSs was um, not, not quite as far along perhaps as in other jurisdictions. Again, I heartily recommend it um, as useful for documenting what your responsibilities are and what decisions you've reached based on the information that um, your client has provided you. In times like what we're going through now, it's also a really, really effective way for your client to gain comfort that there is a plan. Um, you've thought about some of the issues that they're experiencing now in terms of market volatility and market downturns and why it may uh, make sense to stay with the current strategy um, as you've agreed to in the past. So to help them sort of overcome some of the behavioral urges that they may have to um, bail out and um, lock in some losses. Um, since, I, since I was there in 2016, um, I've also introduced this idea of an achievement policy statement, which is basically taking the same sorts of documentation and applying it to a decumulation strategy. And again, the risk profile, particularly around risk-taking ability um, will help you do that in the achievement policy statement as a companion to the investment policy statement. Closing, closing my comments before we get to your questions, um, that it shouldn't be a black box, uh, client pro risk profiling, uh, and yet it is. That's what a lot of uh, the commercial products are pushing advisors to do. It's sort of a magic solution that pumps out a single number that purports to represent a uh, a risk profile, and we think that that's uh, a mistake. That thoughtful compliance not only puts you in a better 
compliance posture with your regulator, but actually improve the end product by understanding all the three dimensions of risk. Um, you're much better prepared to deliver a satisfactory result to your client. We think it makes sense to rehearse disaster, to sort of talk through the worst case scenario, not, not to scare your client, not to upset them, but just to give them assurance that um, there is a plan and that you're on top of it and that uh, in the contingent event that bad things happen, um, you know what you're gonna be doing on behalf of the client. And it doesn't have to show up in every client review, but it should be something that's featured reasonably often. And finally, the whole point of going through all this is that it's a wonderful opportunity for you to differentiate the value of your professional judgment. We started this by saying that that's what advisors do um, to address some of the subjective issues around risk. Um, you ought to highlight that and make it um, clear that clients are getting your best professional judgment, um, certainly uh, worthy of your continued engagement and frankly, uh, for um, your continuing fee income as well. So I think I'm going to stop there. There's a couple of links if you'd like to go back and take a look at it, including the CFA paper that uh, John and Amy and I wrote, as well as their paper on the Journal of Investing. Mohit, I think I'm going to turn it back to you. So thank you, Bob, for the presentation. Gentle reminder from everybody. You can submit your questions through the question and answer link at the bottom of the screen. So please don't feel shy. I know if it's a physical uh, conference, we would have walked up to the stage or we would have caught up Bob while he was drinking his coffee or having his dinner and had a conversation. Don't worry, you can still do it. Just use the question and answer box, Q&A box. So, so we have a couple of minutes. Uh, let's just start. So guys, uh, Bob, I really loved the uh, as a practicing financial advisor, I really love the way you talked about the different risk uh, tolerance, willingness to tolerate risk, ability to tolerate risk. And that was my uh, thoughts from the CFA program, which I did a few years back. Now I come to see there are different sides of risk taking ability and the behavioral loss tolerance. So that's something interesting, which I took. Also what I took interesting was my whole financial advisor career is primarily focused on behavioral biases of people and it's wonderful that you covered that. I also love the fact that you said there were 200 financial advisors did not significantly do difference from what the simple rule of thumb is, 100 minus age. That's pretty interesting. So um, I have a couple of questions for you. The first question is from Okay, the first question is from Megha Malpani. This is something which I also wanted to ask, but she's framed it quite better. There is an overestimation of willingness to take risk by some investors when their ability could be above average. Hence, their asset allocation could be skewed towards equity or other assets like uh, real estate or something. However, in situations like this, when you had 2008, global financial crisis, and now in coronavirus 2020, it falls apart and the true character of a person or willingness or ability to take risk is understood. How do you tackle the situation? And please do let me know because I'm facing the issue every day. Yeah, so um, I guess two dimensions there. One is you don't sort of set it and forget it. So once you've arrived at a portfolio <laughs> strategy that has underlying uh, preferences for risk, um, it's something that should come up in your discussions um, with your clients. And there's a variety of visual tools that you can use. Um, you know, a, a real common financial planning output these days is uh, Monte Carlo simulations where um, you can sort of project out and predict failure or success for achieving goals based on where you are in your portfolio and making some assumptions about future returns based on historical returns. So it's, um, th those are interesting props to use in those discussions because there's always those paths on the Monte Carlo simulation at the bottom that fail. And so it's useful, I think, to talk to clients about the path, not the end point necessarily, but the beginning um, to see where a couple have dipped down and then um, you know, pick back up again, or indeed where some have fallen and where you might wanna think about essentially a stop loss policy to um, shift the risk posture. So I guess the larger point there is um, these events ought not be surprising um, 
to clients. It's something that you ought to be including in your discussions in the context of preparing for the worst case, um, hoping for the best, um, st structuring a portfolio um, that's appropriate for the financial objectives that they have, but also understanding that bad things can happen in the marketplace and talking through with the client what the implications could be for them depending on the time frame. Does that make sense? Oh, it kind of does. Uh, we've been trying to talk to clients using what happened in 2008 and trying to show what can happen. But unfortunately, um, clients don't read the numbers of the fear factor till the time you get hit. You know, this this thing uh, that every plan is okay till you get hit, right? Yeah. So something like that. So, um, um, about about have, all I. I mean, it's it's a yeah. it's it's a it's a fundamental aspect of human nature, right? That we yeah. love the good news and we're we're not happy at all about the bad news. Um, again, CFAs in particular, a tendency is to talk about the numbers, and sometimes a picture is a much more powerful story. So um, I would I would encourage you to use uh, as many different ways of telling the story as you possibly can. So that's pretty interesting you said about stories. So could you give us some? uh general stories or some assessment how do you think we should use our analysis to do risk because what you said is very clearly the numbers just don't mean that much stories do right so so can you give us examples or assessment tools which have been done so when i've talked to practitioners about this um one theme that keeps coming up is people tend to refocus their clients on the end objective Mm -hmm. And so they get them out of the mindset of what's going on today and, and, you know, what does my account balance look like today and get them focused more on what is it exactly that we're trying to do with this pot of money mm -hmm. and to work backwards from there. And in the case where there's a reasonable time horizon remaining until achievement of those objectives, um, that, that sort of um, puts the client in the context of thinking a little bit longer term beyond um, what's currently happening in the headlines. A client who's um, you know approaching retirement or in retirement, of course, it's a it's a different kind of story there. And I think it's incumbent upon the advisor to have a frank discussion if there are inopportune um, or untimely events like like what we've uh, suffered these last couple of months. Hopefully, the discussions prior to um, COVID um, have kind of prepared people, and and structurally the portfolio strategy is such that um, they're not taking as uh, catastrophic a hit as they might otherwise have given, given what's happened to markets. But again, sort of taking people out of the current environment, taking them to what they're actually trying to do, and then working backwards to relate what's going on now and uh, understanding the time frame that they have to still achieve their goals is often very useful. Uh, so Bob, we have a wonderful questions. Um, so there's this question by um, Somin Das, he says, are the number of questions to evaluate risk also depend upon the size of the portfolio? So in the sense, uh, should we ask more questions if we believe the portfolio is larger? That's a really interesting question and I don't think so. Um, somebody with a very modest portfolio will tend to have more straightforward financial goals um, and yet their um, risk tolerance is just as interesting um, as somebody who's quite wealthy with, with a number of more complex uh, financial objectives. Um, in some respects, you could say that it becomes less important the wealthier your investor simply because they have more cushion to um, recover for, uh, without jeopardizing their essential goals. So somebody who comes to you with, I'm gonna use American dollars, forgive me, but somebody who comes to you with a $50 million portfolio is likely uh, well prepared financially to um, accomplish what they need to to uh, you know pay their pay their mortgage and uh, have a very nice uh, standard of living going into uh, retirement. Whereas somebody who comes to you with a three hundred thousand dollar portfolio is uh, not nearly as able to um, suffer any missteps, and so their their risk tolerance is certainly. Um, um, much more interesting, I, I would say. So it, it's, as a long way of saying, it's, it's probably not much different. It's important for both kinds of clients, but it actually, I think, is more important for um, younger clients or, or uh, clients of less, less wealth. 
a couple of more questions. So guys, yep. before I ask Bob a couple of questions, there will be a feedback link, which is gone. Just try to fill it up. So okay. uh, Bhavik Kakkar gives a great question. What is an achievement policy statement? I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. We were running a little short on time, so I didn't want to go into it too, too deeply. But the idea here is that there's value to documenting everything around a client's portfolio strategy in the investment policy statement. Um, years and years ago, when I first joined the CFA Institute staff, I wrote a, um, a guide to that called Elements of a Individual Investment Policy Statement. If you look on the CFA website, um, if you're really good, you should be able to find that or you can just Google it and, and it should pop up. Um, in recent years, as I've talked with more people about a lot of the decisions that go into helping people spend down their money, so thinking about um, where to draw money first, a um, decumulation strategy going around asset location, around um, tax issues, it occurred to me that it would be useful to document all of that into a, what's essentially a decumulation policy statement. Mm -hmm. And because I knew that clients wouldn't understand what decumulation was, um, I chose to frame that as positively as possible as an achievement policy statement. So the, the things that you want to achieve with your wealth, this would be where you would document um, the policies around that in terms of um, liquidity, asset location, tax strategy, all of those um, kinds of issues. Um, so I also wanted to ask you something about rehearsed disaster. What is that about? So rehearse disaster is, um, again, uh, this, this isn't probably the right time to do it now that we've come through one disaster or the first part of a disaster. <laughs> but in good times, it's um, talking with your clients about the fact that you are vigilant and are aware of the possibility of downturns and helping them understand what you will do in the worst case. And there's a really careful balance that you need to achieve here, right? Because if you talk about disaster every time you see a client, they're not going to like talking to you. You know, it's, it's not a happy conversation. And yet you want to instill in your client that there is a plan, that you're fully prepared to execute the plan, to stay the course with the portfolio strategy, if that's what you've decided with your client, or to de-risk the portfolio at some point, if that's what you've agreed to with the client. But they just sort of need to know that when bad things happen, you're ready so that you're not caught flat-footed and being as reactive as um, it appears that many, many people are uh, when disaster does strike. So Bob, I have uh, two more questions I wanna ask you. One is pretty interesting. One is something which I also wanted to ask you about. Uh, it's by Bedanath Bayaku. So he's a candidate, he asked you, you suggested that clients who take paragliding might not be as risky because would like to take risk. But uh, those clients may be also taking risk. How is it different from, so, okay, let me just rephrase the question. But the client may take risk financially. How do we come to understand the difference from the question, client why risk questionnaire? So in the sense, how do we frame it? Because human behavior is what we're trying to uh, analyze over here using risk questionnaire. How do we try to analyze that Personal human behavior is very different from financial human behavior. Yep, indeed. And, and it's a mistake to try to um, combine the two um, or to make inferences about one from the other, um, as, as we talked a little bit about. So the best predictor of uh, financial risk tolerance is actual uh, past behavior. And again, mm -hmm. in some, some respects, we're fortunate now in that we have this, this awful incident to uh, shock the market and see how people have actually um, reacted. That's um, very, very instructive to how uh, advisors should understand their clients' true risk preferences. You can also construct some um, questions that pose choices to uh, investors um, that are hypothetical, but that will reveal their preferences um, around risk. So their ability to take on um, a, a potential investment that has um, a, a, a chance of losing a certain amount of money in furtherance of achieving a financial goal, their willingness to sign on to that kind of investment at varying levels of potential loss will be uh, potentially very useful to um, your understanding of their, their risk tolerance. So there are ways of getting at it through past experience, um, the real actual behavior of your client, 
and careful modeling through through thoughtful questions of potential choices that they might make without projecting too far into the future. Um, Bob, one final question. How should advisors separate their own bias from that of the client? You know, this is a huge problem with over here. Yeah, you know, and that's 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 a great question. I think if I really knew the answer to that, um, I'd, uh -huh. I'd have a unique uh, <laughs> lock on the market. So, so here's the problem. Um, we, we talked at the beginning of the presentation about how advisors think they're applying professional judgment and maybe they're not doing such a great job. We, that correlation of 0.4 to a, to a psychometrically sound questionnaire and then those 200 advisors that they studied who didn't do much other than subtract out the age and apply that to be the equity portion. Um, and yet we say that the advisor's professional judgment is worth something and ought to be differentiated. So the way I counsel clients is probably different than the way that you counsel clients. And um, between the two of us, we're offering something unique um, and, and differentiated. So the real trick is how do you figure out when I'm doing something that's different and useful versus when I'm applying judgment that's faulty because of my own cognitive biases. I feel, I feel badly for the client because I don't think the client can really discern that. Um, for the advisor, I think it's a case of going back and thinking about um, everything that you learn in the CFA program and, and continuing education about cognitive and behavioral biases and thinking about how that might affect your thinking and rethinking some of your longest, most cherished beliefs about how markets work and how investment strategy works and constantly testing your assumptions. You don't have to do that in front of a client. You don't have to express doubts in front of a client, but I think it's a healthy thing for you to revisit a lot of your long held truths and make sure that you're not being blinded by your own uh, cognitive issues. Brilliant, pretty brilliant. Um... Uh, before I leave you go, uh, before I allow you to go, could you suggest me some good risk management tools which are available in the public domain? So no, um, just because uh, this was an easier answer when I was on staff at CFA Institute because CFA <laughs> didn't want to be um, in the in the business of endorsing commercial providers, uh, and now as a as a private uh, person, uh, I'm also not in the business of of making endorsements. Um, Finometrica has a has a big footprint in India. Um, I will say I think they they do a credible job of of um, of attacking this problem, but there are other good vendors out there as well. And the and sort of the more you look, the more you find um, that's that's interesting or that um, is is sometimes a little disheartening in terms of the casual approaches that some vendors are bringing to this. I think if people um, Think about the red flags that we talked about. Think about some of the questions yeah. around reliability and validity and just have some, you know, 20 minute conversations with vendors. They'll get a sense for who's doing a robust, thorough job of this and, and who isn't. Absolutely. Um, Sorry. <laughs> 110%. Bob, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us today. It is absolutely delightful. Oh, my, my pleasure. As a reminder to our listeners and our viewers over here, please complete the evaluation survey which has appeared on our screen at the end of the session. I know it takes a bit of pain, but it's absolutely useful and we love this survey. CFS Society Indian members can claim professional learning credit by logging in online on the professional learning tool. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. It was a delight being over here. Thank you so much.